Hi, I'm Ryan Schultz from The Ohio State University. In this short lecture, I'm going to introduce the history of the Japanese language and also offer a crash course in the very basics of modern Japanese. This will not by any means prepare you to speak or read the language, not even a little bit. However, it will help you recognize Japanese as distinct from Chinese, Korean, and other East Asian languages, and it might also pique your interest in actually undertaking the process of learning Japanese. We'll begin our story here with a seemingly simple question. What is the origin of the language spoken by the nearly 130 million people of the Japanese islands, as well as by many residents of Hawaii, Brazil, and other parts of the world that have significant numbers of Japanese immigrants? Our quest begins in the archives. The earliest written records of the Japanese language date back to the late 5th century AD. But it's not until the 8th century that we can begin to access a broad literary tradition in written Japanese. What these older tales, poems, and documents reveal to us right away is that Japanese has not been exactly the same language across its history. This should be no surprise, of course. All human languages have changed considerably over time. The language used in these 8th century works is typically referred to as Old Japanese. Many of the greatest works of pre-modern literature, such as Murasaki Shikibu's Tale of Genji, were written in Old Japanese. From about the 13th century to the end of the 16th, we see a general shift in language patterns into what is called Middle Japanese. Historically, this corresponds roughly to the rise of warrior rule in Japan, following the decline of imperial power and prestige after the cultured Heian era ended in 1185. By 1600, the country was reunified at last, and the peace of the Tokugawa period brought with it the emergence of new Japanese. Though the language of today's residents of Tokyo or Osaka is far removed from that of the Tokugawa samurai, it still shares most of the same basic traits of pronunciation and semantics. The same can't be said for Old and Middle Japanese. Old Japanese, for example, had eight different vowels in comparison to the only five used in New Japanese. All right. So we've established that Japanese has changed over time through a process of continual evolution. Let's make that understanding just a touch more complex. Neither Old nor Middle nor New Japanese were monolithic languages spoken uniformly everywhere in Japan. Instead, there were a number of different regional dialects of Japanese. And indeed, the forms of those dialects that have survived up to present times can be so different in sound that a speaker of the standard dialect might not even be able to understand them. However, that standard dialect, the one used in Tokyo and taught in school across Japan, the standard dialect can be understood by all Japanese, so there are no general communication barriers. In other words, if you study Japanese in a classroom or a textbook, you will learn the Tokyo dialect, the standard. Depending on where you're from, you might also learn a dialect from your parents or grandparents, and that dialect would influence exactly how you sound. Sort of like the relation between the general Midwestern English of TV newscasters and, say, a Southern drawl in English. Okay, we've now sketched out a broad historical framework for Japanese as a language. However, we still don't have a sense of its origins. Where did it come from? How did it develop into a form recognizable as Japanese? The fact is that, although this seems like an easy question, it's really incredibly hard. Without a time machine, language is quite difficult to trace in the absence of written documents from the past. And the problem is that by the time we have access to Japanese documents, their language was clearly already established. Thus, we have to enter the domain of historical linguistics and try to put the story of Japanese together from bits and pieces and remnants of its past still remaining in its later forms. Let's start from basic facts. We can confidently say that the Japanese language is in Japan today and that it must have come there from somewhere else. We know this because the islands of Japan are volcanic in origin, and their formation was rather late on the geological timescale. In fact, it was late enough to allow us to state that everything on these islands, not just the language, must have come from somewhere else. 
Japan simply didn't exist for enough time that the long process of evolution could have independently produced higher plants or animals there. That higher category obviously includes human beings, and so it means that those people who spoke the oldest form of the Japanese language came from beyond the islands. This is hardly a profound revelation, but unfortunately it represents the extent of consensus on this subject among scholars. We cannot even say with authority whether Japanese came from the continent, from other nearby islands, or from both in some mixture, nor can we say when that might have happened. Probably, the direct ancestor of old Japanese arrived somewhere around the 2nd century BC, at a time when the archaeological record of Japan attests to a large number of other outside elements being imported into Japan and replacing or merging with the island's existing culture. Most likely language was part of that. So ends what we can say concretely about the origins of Japanese. Fortunately, the introduction of Buddhism to Japan in the 5th and 6th centuries brought with it the Chinese writing system, and so created a literary culture that has made its way to us across time. These works were composed in Old Japanese, which was totally different from Chinese in pronunciation and grammar. However, they were, nevertheless, written in Chinese. This was accomplished through the use of a complex system of annotation, known as kanbun. In some cases, Chinese characters known in Japanese as kanji were used to represent their original meanings in Chinese. In other cases, they were simply used phonetically as stand-ins for a particular sound used in spoken Japanese. Many works written in this hybridized way have survived. The earliest available to us, a mytho-historical collection of tales known as the Kojiki, dates to about the 8th century. Now, written Chinese is quite the information-dense language, with each of its thousands of complicated characters representing a complex idea. Using kanji to simply express the phonetic sounds of Old Japanese was incredibly cumbersome and awkward. It might take 20 or more strokes of the brush just to draw out a single character that would stand for a sound like wa. Writing an entire Buddhist text out like this was far too time-consuming to be practical. As a result, in the 9th century, Japanese Buddhist monks advanced the creation of a stylized set of simple derivative characters, each representing a single sound in Japanese with only a few strokes of the brush. Full Chinese characters were still employed to express complex words and ideas, while these shorthand characters, called kana, could be used to quickly write out distinctly Japanese words as well as the basic grammatical terms and markers. Eventually, this system diverged into two forms. One, called katakana, was used almost exclusively by men and was employed in the writing of Buddhist texts, government documents, and so on. This was the original kana script. The other, known as hiragana, developed later as a kind of cursive originally associated with writing by court women, who were generally not permitted to learn Chinese characters due to their association with state business. After the development of kana, the story of Japanese is very much just one of further evolution and change up to present times. So let's now turn to a consideration of the basic details of the Japanese language as it exists and is used today. First, we'll talk about spoken Japanese. Japanese is a syllabic language with five vowels, a, i, u, e, and o. With the exception of the n sound, in Japanese, consonants never appear alone. They are always joined to a vowel to make a distinct phoneme called a mora, with sounds like ka, shi, te, or sa. This gives the language a distinct rhythm and even a kind of internal rhyme that has resulted, for example, in a very different kind of poetic and songwriting style in comparison to English. For example, at some point you've probably read or even written haiku poetry in English, and you were probably told that although haiku poems have a strict 575 syllable structure, they don't rhyme. Well, that might be true in English, but it's not really a meaningful observation in Japanese, 
because basically any expression will have a kind of internal rhyme because of the moda structure. For example, listen to this reading of the most famous haiku in Japanese by the poet Basho. Hear how the vowel structure means that it has an internal rhyme automatically? One other comment on spoken Japanese. Though it does not use tones to distinguish words like Chinese, it does use a falling pitch accent placed on different mora to distinguish meaning between some homonyms. This is probably the hardest part of the language for foreign learners to master, but it doesn't really impede understanding so much. On to grammar. Japanese uses a subject, object, verb order. For example, the English expression, the girl kicked the ball, would be written or spoken in Japanese as something rather more like the girl the ball kicked. Japanese nouns have no grammatical number or gender, and plurality, for example, has to be understood from context, with the sole exception of a few specialized nouns that have inherently plural meanings. Both verbs and adjectives are conjugated for tense in Japanese, and of some interest to speakers of English is the fact that there is nothing like the future tense in Japanese. Instead, something called the imperfective aspect is used for both present and future meanings, and so the speaker's intent must be understood from context. There is also an elaborate system of honorific speech used to express rank and social hierarchy through language. By using different vocabulary and conjugational forms, one can indicate humbleness, politeness, or respect, and each of these has its own rules. Honorific speech is often thought of as one of the most difficult parts of the language for foreign learners, but don't worry if you're thinking about picking up Japanese. Brain scans have shown that even most native speakers of the language have to make a special effort to conjugate and form honorific expressions. Okay, with the basic characteristics of the spoken language down, we can now look at written Japanese. Just as in the 9th century, Japanese today is written with three different scripts. Kanji, the Chinese characters, hiragana, a stylized syllabic script with cursive shapes, and katakana, a sharper looking syllabic script. Each of these has a specific role. In general, kanji are used to represent nouns and the root meanings of verbs and adjectives. Hiragana is used for grammatical elements, such as conjugations and topic and object markers, along with a few special Japanese words. Katakana is used to write loan words from European languages and is also occasionally used as a kind of bold form of hiragana. It's also worth noting that any kanji character can be written using kana instead, and this makes sense given that kana simply encode the sounds of the Japanese language. Learning to read kanji, then, is based on memorizing both the meaning of the symbol and its pronunciation. And to make matters a little more difficult, a single kanji can have multiple pronunciations depending on how it's being used. All right, let's take a look at an example sentence. One meaning, this is my pen. Kore wa watashi no pen desu. Kore is a pronoun meaning this. It's written in hiragana, since it's a basic part of the language's grammar. Wa is a marker sound that indicates that kore is the topic of the sentence. It's also in hiragana. Watashi means self. It's like saying I or me in English. It's written using kanji, and you can see that the complex Chinese character for it looks quite different from the simpler kana that make up the rest of the sentence. No is a possessive marker, and it's written in hiragana, as we'd expect for a basic grammatical component. Pen is a foreign loan word here, and the fact that it's written in katakana reflects that. Finally, desu is the copula, a basic verb meaning something like is or to be in English. As you can see, even this simple Japanese sentence uses all three scripts. We can use this fact to help us distinguish easily between written Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which is quite the helpful skill even if you never learn any of these languages. On the slide here, you can see three bits of text copied from a major newspaper written in each of those East Asian languages. If you've been paying attention to the shapes of the kana, 
I'll bet you can already tell which one of the three is Japanese. Look for the simpler shapes of hiragana and katakana, mixed in with the complex forms of the kanji characters. Got it? It's the second one. Even though both Chinese and Japanese use Chinese characters, the simpler shapes of the kana don't appear in Chinese, because they're uniquely Japanese after all. And the Korean Hangul writing system looks totally different from both of them. I hope that this introduction into the very basics of the Japanese language and its history has been interesting, and I hope that it will inspire you to consider studying Japanese in the future. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu.